All right, thank you so much for coming back promptly. So our plan now is we have a half hour to engage in a discussion with our speakers from this morning. And um, so I'll briefly get started, but I always really enjoy the uh, questions from the audience. And so uh, if you all can be thinking about any uh, questions or reflections you had on the talks this morning and also continuing from yesterday, um, I'll just start off with an initial question, but please do go ahead and come up to the microphones um, or I get the impression those of you uh, watching online can also submit questions. So uh, by all means, feel free to do that. So let me just start with one uh, initial question. I'd be curious if you all have any thoughts in listening to each other's presentations this morning, if there were any themes that you thought were particularly important or responses that you had to each other's talks just to get us uh, started. So I just invite um, any of you if you wanted to reflect on, on things that you wanted to bring out from the, from the talks. And any of you can go ahead and start, whoever's motivated. Oh, speak. There we go. Okay, now it works. Good. Um, so, I, so I didn't get to hear quite all of the talks because I came came in part way this morning. But um, from the ones that I did hear, I think one of the things that um, and that's also repeatedly emerged in my own work is that we shouldn't take these techniques and then throw away everything that we already know about doing good science. Right, uh, like the, these techniques need to go hand in hand with doing good science, um, and that includes reproducibility, and it includes you know understanding everything about what we're doing, and it includes still you know asking good questions and validating answers in the lab and so on. Yeah, so I, I guess I had a similar um, you know thought. Um, I, I I think. Uh, uh, something that is worth thinking about, though, uh, is uh, so what is the difference between having a model of a system that you care about? So like what's the effect of a particular chemical going to be on a particular tissue type? And then having uh, a system that generates a model that um, gives you a prediction about that and having a model of that system. All right, so you, so ultimately you, you want something where you can say, I can understand something about a feature of this chemical and its effect on a tissue. I have a system that gives me a prediction about that, but I don't understand the system, so let me generate a model of the system. Now I, can, I think there could be a lot of value in having a lot of, in understanding the tool that you're using. Um, the thing I think I worry about is, is the idea that one of the things that understanding will do is give you insight into that first system. And I, 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 there I worry there's, there's a bigger gap, that un understanding the way your tool works may not, may be orthogonal to uh, the way the world works. And partly that may be because the data that you gathered, that you used to build your tool, are capturing pe features of the world that eventually you want to you know, later say, oh, those weren't the right features. Um, so I, I, I just want to be circumspect about that. It's not saying that um, explainability you know, isn't, isn't worthwhile or something like that. Um, I think it is. It's just more understanding what its value might be. So my comment's going to be similar to the preceding two, but um, I'll compress it to this. I think a lot of science is about modeling why things happen. And in this space, I think we need to think about modeling how it happens, but also modeling how we see it. How we, how we get the data. So if that's from a survey, there are maybe biases in the way people respond. There are differences in the way people respond. And we try to think about what's the probability this observation could have shown up, and we try to adjust for that. Um, when we do things on these large scale data sets, sometimes we're kind of forgetting that we didn't design how they were collected. I think to, to your point, they may have been measured or designed and measured in different ways at different scales over different time periods. Um, and, and some of that gets lost in, in, in the volume. Um, so the data are always greener if you didn't collect them. You, you don't know the agony that went through some of the measurements and compromises you had to make along the way. And, and so the, I think some of the content area contribution, which is just experience, is talking about how measurements happen in this field and how does it occur and, and what do those d numbers in the, in the data lake mean um, and what's involved in getting them. So trying to understand the measurement process as well as the uh, generative process. So the 
climate colleagues talk about the, the data model, modeling how you see the data, and then the process model, what's the process driving the climate changes. And having those two things fit together, I think, is a helpful um, dichotomy. So thinking about how you measure it and at what scale and, it, and how, you, how you measure it and what you're trying to find out, I think, are two layers of the same problem. Ah, thank you. Teamwork. <laughs> so at the high level, uh, what what I think the discussion this morning struck me the most is is how strongly the the depth and rigor of statistical modeling is connected to ethics of doing science, and how data modeling really starts with data collection, which we typically don't think about, and how much we need to change the educational process uh, and including education educators. And of course, I'm a university professor educating students how important it is to generate data objectively and how important it is to, to develop tools that capture data without human bias. But, but this sort of this, this connectivity between the rigor of science and the ethics of science uh, and how it impacts what we do and, and predictions that we make and develop science, that, that's really, I think, you know, Lance and, and Alex, your, your talks were, in that regard, highly fascinating. But I'm thinking how to translate this into education. One of the things that I was thinking about this morning that I think connects up with some of what you all said, uh, one of the ideas I really like in the philosophy of science, there's a lot of discussion of is there a single scientific method or you know, multiple methods, how do these different approaches relate, um, that one of the key aspects of scientific method is learning about the different kinds of errors that we can make, the different pitfalls that we can run into, and finding ways to respond to them and prevent them. And I think when we're moving into these kinds of new areas, you know, one of the themes that struck me is we're learning about the kinds of pitfalls or errors that we need to watch out for. And I think that's one of the things we want to be thinking about how can we work in these new areas um, in ways that address the potential things that can go wrong. So um, it looks like we've got some uh, questions set. Maybe we can start with Jason uh, over here, and then we can come over to the other side after that. I'm uh, Jason Moore from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, there was a MIT Tech Review article that came out this week on making the claim that some deep learning analyses can use as much carbon as five automobiles over their entire lifespan, which is pretty shocking. Uh, and there have been similar articles about Bitcoin mining. I was wondering if any of you have thought about the, uh, the ethics of the green, greenness or lack of greenness of artificial intelligence and machine learning and how that fits into some of the other issues that you brought up. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one thing, so on the hype, hype curve thing, when you're, when you're going up the top, the first generation of science is often showing, doing something because you can. Um, I'm doing something bigger. I'm doing something different. I'm doing, and that, and the, the productivity plateau is can you do it well and efficiently and, you know, does it just become, does it become a tool? And some, some people aren't interested in that part. Some people are. And, and so I think, you know, a lot of the deep learning, and, and I know this is probably an oversimplification, a lot of it's still driven by sort of a Kaggle mindset, right? You want to do something and you're competing and you're getting a little better and, and it's, it's a win, you know, who are you trying to impress with your work is other people doing this. And then the, what works really well for image classification was doing it a lot. You have access to a lot of processors, which uses a lot of the energy. It may not be in your office, but it's in the cloud. Um, one of my statistical colleagues said, one of his friends like 10 years ago told him, you know, we, we worry a lot about collecting the right data. I think really the future is deciding which data do you really need and what do you throw away. It's not going to collect it. It's, do I get, can I get as good an answer without looking at every possible combination. So the, you know, a lot of the big advances in, in some of the ability to, to do the classification is being able to manage and, and parse out the work to look at everything carefully, but it's, it's less so, of, and, and put it all back together and have it work fast. It's less so about efficiency because the resources were sort of unlimited, there were, or less limited. 
And if, you know, all of us are maybe old enough to remember deleting files and stuff because you're, you didn't have any space. You had, to, you had to program to read something. And, and, you know, bioinformatics is dealing with this now. They generate all this data and they use a little tiny bit of information. But do they need to save the whole thing for reproducibility or, or not? So I think that it's that second wave of figuring out, okay, we can do this. What are some ways to do it and get a good answer that maybe isn't just... It, 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 some of it's brute force. It's elegant brute force, but uh, on the energy side, it's using a lot. I, I think what I would also add to that is that um, this is not a problem in computer science that is specific to deep learning, right? Um, you know, computers use energy, um, and if we do more with them, then they use more energy, right? Um, and one of the things that I think is educationally interesting about this is that um, there's actually a very strong connection between the energy usage that computers use and the computational complexity of the program that you've written. And computational complexity is already something that we teach all computer science students to try to optimize for, right? So they're already sort of naturally learning happily, um, or things would be much worse, how to, how to optimize for energy usage, right? Um, but aren't necessarily making their, that connection in their classes. Um, and so I'm actually working with a colleague in environmental studies right now to try to integrate that into some of the computer science curriculum um, so that students learn about the connection um, to energy usage at the same time as they're learning about computational complexity. So Gary? Uh, Gary Miller, Columbia. I want to go back to this educational piece. Um, you know, I think with, with graduate students, this is a relatively easy thing to do because they're in classes, they're taking biostats, they're learning these things. But when you go out of the people that are in depth in learning, how do we deal with the people in this room? And, and I think that we need to come up with some creative ways, and I'm gonna ask if you have some ideas to this. Like what I can think of as a outgoing editor, if I was starting as an editor in a new journal, is I think in a field, this, this is not going away, right? This is not an area that's gonna be going down in time. This is gonna increase. Is you almost need like a monthly column on the ethics around machine learning, AI, and things for that field that's discipline specific. Because you know we're in this room, we're thinking about it, but there's a lot of other people that aren't, and it needs to be a constant reminder because they're hearing about it on you have Facebook and Google, but how does it apply to them? And so it's something where it has to be discipline specific, but something in that way of doing that. And other ideas you have for how do we kind of keep this discussion going and get people to keep thinking about it so they don't make these mistakes and they start going to something without thinking about the right connections and collaborations first. Thoughts? Yeah. Um, so I collaborate with people in several different fields. And so the field of epidemiology, and you write a paper in epidemiology, there's an angsty paragraph in the conclusions you always write about how you could possibly be wrong. Um, so it's because, of, no, I mean, it's just the nature of the field is about observational data, and they've always been about observational data, and they're always concerned. And so the causal inference infusion in epidemiology is, is recognizing that's important. Um, my colleagues in ecology who do a large field, you know, they build a field enclosure and they have mice in there and they're getting infected with hantavirus. Well, sometimes it rains and sometimes it doesn't. There's still an observational aspect to it, but because there's a feeling of design, they treat it as if it were in a lab and everything was controlled. And there's not the same kind of humility at the end. Uh, and, and so I think across science, I, I think statisticians need to do this. I think you know, every, having some humility in the results of your research is important. Um, an editor can have some, uh, some sway on that in the papers that appear in their journal on, you know, it's great that you said this, but I think your claim is just, a, you know, at the end about how this is going to save millions of people or whatever is just going too far, and that's got to... But I, I think the column about having a, a monthly column on ethics is a good one. I think it would need to be curated in such a way that it's different every time and doesn't hit the same things over and over again. Because I think people get, yeah, I, you know, I, I use 2001. Everyone uses 2000. Well, and my students don't because they don't know the movie. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Minority Report, um, the laws of robotics, you know, there's some kind of classic stuff to start with. But, you know, it's the real challenge of I made a, you know, making a choice of including this data or that data or just because they were all available in the corpus, it might, you know, using them all, is that an ethical choice? Starting to get people to wonder about that. I mean, I think students are often very curious because they're learning all this. They don't know any better that, they, that people don't consider this. But uh, so that's some 
just stream of consciousness on those. So I, I think a, a, a big part of the problem is, is the extent of the hype and the extent to which that's sort of gotten out of the, the, the box and is out in the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I think you know, epidemiological studies aren't usually the topic of conversation around most tables. You know, I mean, yeah, right? I mean, but, but, um, but, you know, I think those are things about which people are more likely to be genuinely skeptical. But you say artificial intelligence and people get images, you know, of, of, of magical devices. And, um, yeah, so I think that we have regulatory structures, like if what you want to do is market a product that you can sell anywhere, you know, I think we can deal with things, you know, in the regulatory way, in, in journals. So I think some of the hype that is allowed to, to percolate down into journals um, needs to be ratcheted back. Uh, my worry is the homebrew stuff. You know, um, you're not trying to market a product that you're going to sell uh, you know, across the United States, you know, in your institution, you've got somebody who's telling you they can they can build a widget to predict, you know, who's going to live or who's going to die or whatever. Um, and you know, or yeah, yeah so so it, it, educating stakeholders about what turns out to be relatively banal, long term, you know, old wine that's in new bottles, and getting people to see the degree to which this new bottle is filled with old wine so that they can be more informed consumers of these materials, I think would be a really good thing. So I, I, think, um, I think a lot about these issues um, as an educator. Um, I think we need some form of reinforcement learning, uh, where reinforcement is done in the form of policies, um, educational policies, publishing policies that prevent bad or useless science um, through criteria applied to um, the outcome of research. We focus on methods, we should focus on, on problem solving. When we focus on problem solving, what are the criteria of good solving versus useless solving? And, and one example, I'm a, a journal editor as well, uh, associate editor, uh, is that in my field, for many, many years, there were publication after publication after publication on so-called chemical descriptors. And people from math and computer science background have been publishing endless papers on new types of chemical descriptors. And that was ended with an editorial policy. From a journal that basically said, if you want to publish a paper about new descriptors, here are the criteria that uh, will make this paper acceptable. And this stream of conscious consciousness was basically stopped 10 years ago. And so I think that that's, that's the type of action that, that is possible to do speaking specifically about the editorial policies. All right, uh, why don't we go on over to Rick. Hi, Rick Wycheck, uh, NIEHS. I just want to build on a, uh, a comment that I made at the end of my introductory talks yesterday. It's really about data quality. So if, if all of the artificial intelligence and everything we're doing is going to make sense, it, it really relies on high quality data coming you know, into the databases. So I always, and I talked yesterday also about where you get what you reward. So one of the, the, the fundamental questions is, how do we reward investigators to take ownership around careful collection and careful annotation of data? Fact is that we currently reward people for massaging data in such a way that, that you come up with spectacular endpoints that you can publish in high profile journals and uh, you get that acknowledgement, you get tenure, and you move on. <laughs> so we have to figure out, as a scientific community, how do we reward the careful collection and annotation of data sets? And I would propose that we have to start um, you know, changing you know, the, these reward policies and standards. So someone who spends a huge amount of time carefully collecting data and, and annotating and putting it into a database should get a, a, a citation. There should be a reference to this, and the number of times that data is used carefully um, should be part of their, their CV. So we have to figure out how to do this. So again, how do we reward people to create those, those data sets? And then coming to a point that Nicole made yesterday, we have to start thinking about standardized vocabularies and, um, and um, ontologies. And if we reward people for collecting data around standardized ontologies and, and vocabularies, they will do it. So it's uh, just a challenge. How do we change that um, you know, in, the, in the scientific community? 
I don't, I don't have an, an answer to that. That's a huge, huge question. I just want to raise a, a side issue, uh, which is um, I think we have to balance all of the, the wise things that you just said about the importance of incentivizing people to create the uh, you know, high quality um, you know, data sets that these techniques rely on. And we, we have to also make sure we don't create a data monoculture. You know, uh, uh, I mean, sign diversity, the, when you don't know what the space looks like, having a lot of people exploring different parts of the space is really important to efficient scientific discovery. And so I, I would hate to see, you know, the sort of the press towards data and the sloping down towards people doing science on a limited set of, you know, limited number of data sets homogenize science too much. So I would say we need, we need all the quality control that you mention and, and keeping diversity and people exploring very different alternatives um, and maybe even using different data sets to do the same thing. Um, just briefly, I think quality control and rewards are just, well, they're connected, but, but very different. Uh, rewards deal with publication. I think Science on Nature has scientific data journals so you could publish your data set, but if the data is crappy and you get reward for sharing, then, then it creates another problem. So the issue of data collection uh, has many different facets, one of which is technologies. Uh, most computers at UNC, for instance, and, and as far as I know, not only at UNC, are disconnected from the internet. Computers that are connected to, 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 uh, um, uh, to instruments. Right, for different reasons. So I think uh, both need to be addressed within each institution. Journals can reward people by publishing their data and giving data sets DOIs, and then it makes it citable. I think I would also add that um, I hope it is not actually as separate in terms of the reward system as you describe, right? Because I would like to believe that if we do a good job of curating and creating good data sets, then that allows us to do more thoughtful science, right? Which then will naturally lead to publications. Um, and so, you know, I guess my, my hopeful version of this is that um, the reward systems may are already naturally be rewarding some of these efforts. And um, so I had the one slide where I talked about this was the one where I interposed a picture of a tree uh, <laughs> for a bit, no good reason, an accident this morning. Um, so this, this, this opinion piece in um, Nature that came out this week is a proposal for how to do a variant of the DOI for these data sets. And as I've thought about it, first of all, if I've given talks like this, I talk about the importance of citing um, software and data in a way that's consistent and actually builds up kind of an a, a, a appropriate record of your accomplishment. Um, but also recognizing that data and software continue to grow and live. So sort of the GitHub framework for uh, software allows you to get to a particular version and compare my version to the version that was then, not what they're doing now. And I think data kind of needs to be the same way. And a citation needs to be clear on, I'm comparing my results to the same data set that Alex used, but it's two years later, and there's been some, some of those mistakes were corrected. And so if I test it on the new one and compare it to his, it's not apples to apples. Um, the, the other thing I'll mention is uh, I was talking, I was in a, uh, another workshop like this on AI and subsurface data for the mining technologies. And there it's very proprietary. The companies spend billions of dollars to get the data, and they don't want to share it. And they, the same curation question came up. And um, the thought I had is who? If you're if you're the person responsible for curating the data set, it's very important. We all agree with that. But who who do you who are you trying to impress with your work? If you're only trying to impress the lead investigator for the study, then you're just a technician for them. It's important work, but if you want it recognized as a contribution, the people they should be trying to impress are the other data curators in other projects, and and they should be having meetings like this about oh so and so was able to do this, so and so looked at these data sets, and they chose to include this one, this one chose not to include this one, the different results result, and so like Alex is saying, it needs to be recognized as a contribution to the whole scientific community, not something that's relegated to a student or a postdoc, and they graduate, and nobody knows how to recreate what they did. And uh, that hasn't caught up. 
And for that to be a long-term career path for people to, this is what we're talking about with our administration, if we want to hire good people to do this and have them do it on multiple projects for a career of 30 years, it, you know, they, they're going to be bought up by industry to do this in a propriety setting and make a whole lot more money. So we have to give them a nice place to work, a fulfilling career, and a set of colleagues. Um, are they faculty members? Maybe. Are they research faculty, you know, tenure track, research track? Or is it a staff position? Is it a staff position you actually treat like somebody important? Uh, you know, I think universities and research institutions need to think about that. Um, when we're re evaluating grant proposals, if we see they've got TBA, postdoc, data curation, you know, I don't count that as much as if they've got somebody who's got a bio sketch that shows they know how to do this kind of thing. And, but we're, you know, I haven't known how to do that very long. So I think there's, 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 there, I think, I, I, I agree with Sorrell, I think there's some structures in place for already doing this, and I think we can get better at making those structures work. But it's, um, uh, it, it varies across some of the different, um, the units. So I, I think there's work to be made. Uh, there was a special issue of a journal, and, they, and it was on statistics and machine learning and stuff. It was like practical guidance, and they wanted some kind of figure for it. And what they decided, or we decided on, was a robot with a mop. Um, so, you know, it's both high tech and low tech at the same time, and it needs to be recognized as a contribution. You know, routine analysis doesn't mean it's routine and that important people shouldn't do it. So, you know, you need someone who can do this really well. So it sounds like there were some talks like that. Um, yesterday, and uh, it's come up in these other settings too. So I'm, I'm glad that the issue's percolating, but I can't point to places that really have it down except kind of inside um, kind of data businesses that recognize the value of doing this well because it's a commodity and now it has a price. And, you know, the scientific value is really high too. So. Yeah, and I think that is a really important question, Rick. I'm glad you're getting us to think about how to align the incentives and promotion and so on with what we need to do this well. Um, so we've got limited time. I'd like to maybe see if um, Kim and Christy can go ahead and pose their questions. Um, we can see if there are any super quick comments or maybe that can also lead into our following discussion We've got, because we've got some good time for that. So um, maybe Kim and Christy, go ahead and share your thoughts. Okay, very quickly, uh, Kim Buckelhide, Brown University, and this is sort of a riff off of Dr. Tropsha's presentation. And so an axiom I learned in my training, um, research training, was that a fool with a tool is still a fool. Uh, and that's what I think we heard. Um, and I guess a corollary of that axiom that I'm taking out of this workshop is that individually, if we're trying to work in a complex landscape like environmental health, biology, we're all fools. Uh, so we have to find the collaboration teamwork approaches and get them rewarded appropriately so that we aren't, you know, so that together we're not so foolish as we are individually. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Great, thank you. So I'm Chrissy pullen from the Natural Resources Defense Council. And my comment and kind of question is about the value structure that the modeler has, for example, and whether or not there should be disclosure of that. And so if I believe that public health should be protected over all things, then I'm going to say that my sensitivity has to be really high. I don't really care so much about the specificity. If I believe that all chemicals are safe and I really just have to you know, have some sort of proof of safety and that could be whatever it is, then you know, so how do we think about the value of the person, of the individual that's developing the model, that's using the model, as we're preparing those things and publishing those things, and then really identifying what the reward structure is that, that's valuable to that person. So if I'm interested in tenure, maybe I could, as long as I get a lot of press and the number of citations, then I'm fine. Uh, you know, if my value, again, is really ensuring that populations are protected, then, and I don't care if my name ever appears in any type of journal, then, you know, maybe I'm designing something different. So how do we think about adding that in, to the models themselves, to the publications, really disclosing where it is that people are coming from and what their value structure is prior to the use and dissemination of that particular model. So thanks, Christy. And actually, maybe that leads into our uh, <laughs> next discussion of ad decision makers and how they actually uh, make use of these tools. So uh, maybe we can go ahead and shift into that panel. And uh, you know, thank you all for your questions. And thanks to our panelists for their thoughts.